PA. Um, and also that I'm going to be sat behind the computer doing a bit of live DJing. This is an all-time first for a lecture. So if you find that the screen goes blank and you wonder what's happening, it's because I'm trying to find a slide that somehow follows the conversation. Um, so I'll hand you over to Andy and Andy Morris. So, That's where we find out if these things are working or not. All right. I'm opening this first of all, Morris. Okay. Hello. Thank you for coming. Okay. Yeah, full house, I think. I'm just going to say, first of all, it's a real pleasure for me to be back. I left three months ago, and now I'm back in quite surreal circumstances. Um, but it's an absolute real pleasure for me, because I'm going to be talking to somebody who is uh, kind of a bit of a hero, really, um, especially from my early youth. Um, so the man uh, with me today, Horace, uh, was the bassist and well, found a member of the specials. Um, um, a very important, pivotally important group uh, from the post-punk period, um, not just in terms of their music, but in terms of and how they dressed, their ideology, their politics. Um, he's been an art student himself, so he's kind of been where you are. But he's also taught. He's also taught as a tutor for students with additional learning needs for ten years. He's a writer. He wrote a book about uh, his travels, diaristic uh, book about travels on the road, which is well received about life with the specials between seventy-seven and eighty-one. And in recent years, over the last five or six years. I guess. Yeah. Um, Horace started uh, making and exhibiting his own work from London to Manchester, Bath to Sheffield, um, exhibitions that have been covered a lot in the press and getting a lot of praise and, and justifiably so. So yeah, just really pleased uh, to be able to do this and, and interview you. The questions, I'm, I think what we're going to do, I'm going to start off talking a little bit about, well we can't let avoid it, the elephant in the room, the specials. Okay, we'll talk about um, Horace's um, time in the specials. But I think if you've got any questions, we'll have questions at the end, but I think we'd both, if people have got questions, you can, we're relevant to what we're talking about, do put your hand up and we would like to sort of field those questions. Okay, so don't be shy. And as Tony says, we'll go along and hopefully things will appear on the board that we can talk about and be relevant to what we're saying. Okay. Um, so Horace, I mean, the first question I've got for you, and because we're all in the room and I've had an art background, everyone here has an art background, and you yourself are from art college. I want to uh, talk to you about the maybe the early days of the formation of the specials and, and how and if Art College had an impact on that formation, what you did. I think traditionally Art College, you know, if you wanted to join a band, in the 60s, if you wanted to join a band, you went to Art College mm -hmm. because The Who did and, you know, um, Keith Richards Keith and Richard. David Bowery and, and The Kinks, blah, 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 blah. So it was... It was kind of almost wasn't it, wasn't it actually expected of you, but I think back in the 70s, um, it would, art school was the, the reserve of the English eccentric and the work shy. I mean, personally, I, I thought I was the former, but I was probably just, just the latter. But I met Jerry Dammers, at, um, who, who formed the specials at, at, at Lanchester Polytechnic in, in, in Coventry. And, and that's, but, that, but, the, but the specials came out of punk, which was sort of anti-art school almost, yeah. if, if you like. It was very much a, 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 younger, a younger movement. Um, but I, I think art school, we, you, you had that sort of creative background. Yeah. You know, the atmosphere was, 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 was there. And because you didn't have to get up in the morning to go to, a, to, a, to do a job. You, know, you had time to, you know, to, yeah. well, to stay out late. You know. I noticed, though, in your book, you... you for quite a while during the specials, you kept a, you kept a job, didn't you? you sort of, you were working yeah, while, yeah, while yeah, trying to do yeah, that kind yeah, of. Yeah, I drove a throw, I drove, I, I got a degree um, yeah. in, in fine art, and then worked, went to work on the back of the back door of Sainsbury's for yeah. six months, <laughs> and ended up driving a frozen food van. But that paid for the specials to, you know, um, to have you know, to do rehearsals yeah. and, and that sort of stuff. So you left. I think you graduated in seventy five. Seventy five, yeah. And then w within a year, the whole landscape of music changed yeah. With, yeah. with punk. Yeah. So yeah. I guess maybe art college is a foundation, but was it punk mm. that drew, drove it forward more so? Oh, definitely. I mean, back then, in sort of 76, 77, um, you had to be either Carlos Santana, 
you know, to, to be as good as that to appear on the stage. You know, uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer and, and um, Yes released triple albums. Yeah. But then along comes the Sex Pistols and The Clash and it just totally blew everything out of the water. And, you know, wow, you know, anybody could be in a group. Yeah. Um, you know, because you, you, you formed a group first, then, you know, you learned to play on stage, you know, in your first, in your first show down, you know. But it was incredibly exciting back then. Yeah. You know, you could go out in, in Coventry the European city of low self-esteem, you know, and um, and see, you know, bands in little pubs four nights a week. You know. yeah. They weren't particularly good, but it was very exciting and it was a really good scene, you know, yeah. and everybody seemed to be in, in a band back then. Yeah. You know. you, but I think it was the same in most cities. I mean, it was the same in Leeds, definitely. You, know. yeah, yeah. you, you, you all know about that. Well, I remember, I, I lived in uh, Hemel Hempstead, which was, you know, a concrete mm -hmm. berg outside uh, London, but I remember... I remember quite young, but I remember that punk thing sort of exploding, even in the sort of the suburbs, mm. you know, and sort of, and, and particularly at this kind of time when your band formed, Special Sport, that kind of movement, that kind of look sort of taking over, mm. you know. Um, with the Special, I used to, I was, I was just telling you there, I used to crib um, Special's records with my brother. My, I, I was eight when you formed. I was 12 when you split up. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> but... In that time, I was a massive, I got a massive fan. But it's all top of the pops, and you know, and the papers, newspapers. Well, you had Sounds and Enemy, Enemy mm. Maker. But um, I think the Specials were a kind of different band. I think that they were kind of, kind of sort of gateway drug kind of band. You had the music. The music was great, obviously, and that's what we were all attached to. But you changed the way, you changed everyone's look in our school. Okay, so you changed the way people dressed, and you changed the way people, people started to dance for one thing, which is something we hadn't done before that. And also, there's the whole ideology of the specials, a kind of certain political um, surround of the specials and the way they presented themselves to the world. I wonder if we just talk to you, well, first of all, about your musical and sort of you know, sartorial influences and where did they come from for the, the special? Well, the, the Clash recorded a version of Junior Mervyn's Police and Thieves on their first album. So they acknowledged that there was reggae. But I think reggae music was always kind of akin to punk music. They were, it was rebel music, if yeah. you like, you know, with the, the Rasta stuff and you know, Bob Marley and that, and, and that resonated with, with the, what was happening in the, the, in the punk scene. And Don Letts, very famously, you know, uh, DJ'd at the Roxy and there were hardly any punk singles, so he, yeah. you know, he'd only play three songs in, all the time in between bands, so he got all his reggae stuff out. And, but, and so dub reggae kind of became the soundtrack to punk gigs. Yeah. So there was, then there was that sort of synergy between the two types of music. When the special started, we were like a reggae band and a punk band. So we'd play a reggae song, then we'd play a punk song, then we'd play a reggae song. Right. And it was kind of like there was two separate groups at, at the same time, it didn't kind of work. So we needed something to kind of bring the two things together. So we sort of dug back in reggae and found Scar, which of course, um, so our punk songs could be slower and our reggae songs would be faster, but, but, you, but very danceable at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And of course, ska was sort of one of the musics that the mods took up mm -hmm. in like sort of, you know, 63, 64, 65. And of course that came purpose built with this look, you know, um, you know the, the tonic suits, you know, the um, Doc Martin, yeah, the loafers, loafers and all yeah. that sort of, um, Ben Sherman shirts, Fred mm -hmm. Perry, all that sort of stuff. And, mm -hmm. In 1978, you could buy a second-hand tonic suit up Gosford Street, you know. From that, they, the suit that I'm wearing on the first album cost me £7.50. Right. You know, it was, it, and, but you could do that back then. You yeah, know, yeah. You can't yeah. do it so much now. So we, it's, there was the... the, the we had the, the punk DIY ethic. We mm. were still buying second-hand clothes. Um, but we looked sharp like, you know, like, like, like mods. And... Which kind of distance ourselves from from punk? You know? Yeah, I think parents exactly. like their children going out like that. You yeah, know, smart. You know, you, yeah. not like have, have you got some spare safety pins, mum? It's like you know, does my suit look good? You yeah, know? yeah, so, yeah. So it was kind of different. And the, the year I'm looking, this is from I think it's from Richard uh, Barnes' book called Mods, which was out in the in the seventies. But um, there was a lot of mod stuff at the time, wasn't it? I mean, Quadrophini came out in seventy yeah, nine, yeah. same year as Mr. And, Hugh Rudin. And to be honest, the the the, the jam had that kind of mod. Style, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. But it was very different. I mean, your music very different because the, the jam didn't take in those kind of influences of other music, really. They did no. sound a bit like the Kings. But they were a rock band, like weren't they? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But that look, I mean, the rude boy thing, um, I remember reading your book that, you, maybe it was Jerry or yourself and Jerry, to distinguish it, the, the mm. idea of the, the kind of Jamaican rude boy. And, yeah. and I remember that being a real thing at school, you know, the wraparounds and, and all that kind of stuff, people wearing very thin ties, suit jackets. And well, it, 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 again, it was, it was the assimilation like the black culture and, and white culture. Yeah. Because you know, the, the, the rude boy look, yeah, we, we weren't rasters. You know, the black guys in our band weren't rasters. You know, they were they were, were rude boys. Didn't they? Yeah, yeah. They adopted that. And I think the influence, because when you look through and you, and you come through the decades, because Britpop obviously happened in the mid '90s, and there's uh, Damon Albarn and people like that, and they're always talking about the Kinks and they're always talking about the Who. But their look to me was very special. So the Ben Sherman, the Harringtons, mm. the way they wore their hair. You know, the, the high jeans and the boots, and uh, I think laterally, when the Reformation, you know, the Reformation, when you reformed, yeah. I think more people acknowledged um, that influence of, of the specials. There's a lot of, right. there's a real mod thing going on at the moment, yeah, isn't there? There's yeah, that kind yeah. of, you know, I don't know, there are people of a certain age to sort of go out and buy motorbikes mm. because they, they couldn't when they were sort of 20, when they would have liked yeah. to. So, but you've got like sort of born again mods as well, you know, yeah, yeah. born again, you yeah, know, Lambretta are. riders, you know. So you've got yeah. that Fred Perry's there, and yeah, the button downs and Harry's. Well, it's a classic British style, yeah. It? It's, Harrington's you know, are in look at it, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> look at you, you, know, you yeah. can tell Harrington's are because they're about 150 quid a pop at the moment. I think right. it's a, um, the other thing I think I've talked about, you know, the fashion, um, but it was a political thing. Um, mm. So when Ghost Town, I mean, the last single, um, you had two number, I think seven top ten singles in a row or something like that, didn't you? Uh, when the last single came out, it was at this, exactly at the same time when Handsworth was on fire, the riots, um, riots throughout the UK because of stop and search and because of poor housing and because of racial tensions between the police. But there's also riots in, I think, a, a month after you played Leeds, I think Chapel Town riots happened. Um, but I thought the specials were always very outspoken about their stance on it. Mm. And, and was that there from... from